So, so today I wanted to ask the question, who are you? Not just who you are as a person, but who you are in Christ. We've looked at this a few times in some different studies, but, but today we really want to dig in and see who you are in Christ. I really think it's crucial to know who you are in Christ. And you know, like I said, we've went over this stuff in some Bible studies and things like that. We've, we've touched on a lot of it. But something hit me about three, three and a half weeks ago. One of our brothers that's here from this congregation, I met in a local business. I walked in and I just said, hi, how you doing? And he said, blessed and highly favored. And you know, I've heard that many, many times, blessed and highly favored, but it never really hit me until that day. There was something about that comment at that particular time that stuck with me. He knew who he was in Christ. That guided him through his everyday life. So that's what I want to look at today. I better grab my notes. Zach, can you grab my glasses out of, you know where they're at? Bring them up, please. I forgot to bring them up. So who are you in Jesus? Um, knowing who you are in, in Jesus is crucial. So let's take a look to start off with who Jesus is. We got In order for us to know who we are in Jesus, we got to know who Jesus actually is. So was he a prophet? Is he just a good man? Is he just some fallacy that is written in on some pages of a book called the Bible? Some call it God's holy word. I call it God's holy word. Or is he truly the Christ, the Messiah, yes. Savior of the world? Amen. So all of us here agree with that That's right. because we've looked in God's word. God's word shows us that. And I want to point out a couple of things in that. So he is the Christ, the anointed one, the Savior of the world. There's prophecy all over in God's word that tells about his coming, who he is, how to recognize him, what he's going to be doing. And as we look through that, all of that prophecy, Jesus fulfills all that prophecy. So see, prophecy, or let me say prophecy fulfilled, helps us to believe, helps our faith, all of those things, because we see it fulfilled through Jesus. So, prophecy fulfilled helps us believe. Let me, let me move on a little bit with that. There are over 25,000 archaeological digs that the world sees proves the Bible to being 100% accurate on history. Now, we know that the Bible is 100% accurate on history. That's no big new revelation to us. But the world is starting to see the Bible's got a lot of history in it that's 100% true. And there has never been a prophecy in God's Word that is inaccurate. It's always 100% accurate. And it's been proven out. So... You know, the world looks at different people. Nostradamus, um, Casey, um, there's a couple of other ones. They're clairvoyants. And they write prophecy down or have written prophecy down in the past. And people follow that. And they're like, oh, look, there's a prophecy right there. And it, it explained exactly what was going on. But let me tell you, those prophecies of all of those clairvoyants that everybody in the world holds up are only 60% accurate. So scripture tells us that if it's not 100% accurate, they're not a prophet. They're not a true prophet. Everything in the Bible that is prophecy has been 100% accurate and has been fulfilled. All right, there's some that we're still waiting on. It's for a little bit later days, uh, but it's 100% accurate. I don't put all my stuff on my iPad. I guess I should, but I can't stand still, so I would be going back here and flipping around, and so I'm just going to use it here. 
So we know Jesus is more than just a good man. He's, he's God revealed in the flesh, literally. He came to rescue us from eternal sin and death. And he died for our sins and he rose again in victory. So I want to go over a couple of scriptures of who Jesus is. This is just a few scriptures to give you a little bit of insight. All right, There's many, many more that tell us. So let's go to the first one, John 1.1. 1, 1. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if we scroll all the way down or go all the way down in your Bible to verse 14 says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the word is Jesus. And the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus is God in the flesh. Let's go to another one. Colossians 2, verse 8 through 9. And I'll give you just a minute so you guys can get to that. What was the trick that Pastor Paul said last week about how to get all the verses down that I'm going to be spewing out. If I say Colossians 2, 8, and 9, just write 2, 8, and 9. That's right. <laughs> and then start digging. And you know, you're going to get into God's Word, and you're probably going to find some other 2, 8, and 9 that's good. Like Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it's not of, is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So Colossians 2, I'm sorry, 8 through 10. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Where was I going with that one? Let's go to 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4. <laughs> Is this New King James Version? Okay. So, but even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds, keep, keep going, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. We do not believe, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So Christ is the image of God. Let's go to three more of them. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. I'm going to be known as the pacer, pacing back and forth up here. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in the time past to the fathers by the prophets. Keep going. Has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. So we know now Jesus is the Son of God, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds. So, you know, when we looked at John 1.1, 1, 1, it said, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if you look at verse 2, it says that all things were made through Him. Again, it says, um, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds. Go to 3 who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, Jesus is God in the flesh yes. and upholding all things by the word of His power. When He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So, He purged our sins. He died for our sins. Yes. And He sat down at the right hand of God. That was Hebrews. Let's go to two more. Colossians 1, verse 13 through 18. I've only got 48 scriptures for us to go through today. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 through 18. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Just that alone tells us exactly who He is. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Keep going. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. 16. 
For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Wow, there's a lot there. All things were created through him and for him. We got two more verses. Is 17 on there? Yes. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Let's go to 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. Come on. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So again, who Christ is, really, in all of that we can see he is God. In charge of all of it. John chapter 14. John chapter 14 verse 8 through 11. John 14, 8 through 11 says, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. Go to verse 9. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me? Remember, Philip was, was one of the, um, one of the uh, original disciples. Um, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So again, he is the Father. Can you, uh, can you say, show us the Father? Keep going. Do we have another one here? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. And you know, that last little part, the Father who dwells in me does the works. If you think about this, so we said Jesus is God in the flesh. Whose spirit do we have? We have Jesus in us, right? We have Jesus' spirit in us. All the power... All of that, the righteousness, everything, who dwells in us, does the works. Come on. All we have to do is yield. But I better not go down a rabbit hole. So, <laughs> it is a rabbit hole if I... Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't want to... I, I will be up here for two hours if we go there. The key is to know Jesus and who He is, not as others see Him, but as the Scripture says... So, so there are Christians out there, there are people of the world and Christians who look at Jesus as a judge. I want to show you a scripture that's going to prove he's not here to judge us and condemn us. All right? So the problem with... All right, I'm going to step out on a limb. This is my opinion. Okay? So I usually do this whenever I'm up in front. I usually give my opinion on something. The problem with talking about Jesus as a judge is usually those guys that are trying to scare you out of hell. All right? Pastor Paul's talked about that long ago. He remembers a lot of that. Fire and brimstone stuff. The problem is, when you have to scare somebody out of hell, that works for the moment. What happens six months down the road? Do you have to scare them out again? So let's show who Jesus truly is. So if we go to John 12, 47. John 12, 47. It says, And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. So he didn't come here to judge us. He came to save us. Amen. And we're going to look at a little bit of that stuff on how he's going to save us. He's a loving God of mercy and grace. He's slow to anger and will not hold faults against you. Has he ever got angry that we know of? Yes, he has. But it was a righteous anger. And he's definitely slow to anger. And again, he's not going to hold our faults against us. Um, and I wrote down here, he's good and his loving kindness endures forever. There will be a time when God judges but you know, the greatest thing is that when he sees, when God looks at us, he sees Jesus. That's right. 
We've been perfected by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Jesus within us. So when God looks at us as followers of Christ, let me preface it with that. As followers of Christ, when God looks at us, He sees Jesus. And He doesn't find any fault in Him. Amen. The only one that has walked to this earth that is faultless. So, in all of this, we absolutely must believe that Jesus Christ is God. Manifest in the flesh, the only begotten of the Father, He was crucified, He died for our sins, and He rose again. That's the gospel in a nutshell. We must believe that. And knowing who you are starts with knowing who Jesus is. Let's, let's take a look at Peter just for a minute. Uh, one of the original disciples, the Apostle Peter. We're going to use him as an example today of how knowing who you are in Christ works in your life. So, Peter really found his true identity and calling when he acknowledged Jesus is the Christ. Up till that point, he was really just Simon the fisherman. He followed Jesus. But you know, his life lacked power. He was just an ordinary man, didn't do extraordinary things. In fact, fishermen at that time, were kind of the low-level people from the area. Once he acknowledged Jesus as the Christ, his identity changed, and he became, became Peter, a rock that Jesus could build his church upon. So, really, your identity comes out when you have that revelation of who Christ truly is in you. Things like uh, who He is and how He loves you, understanding how valued you are by Christ, knowing how righteous He's made you, all of those things help you to become who you are, give you, um, gosh, I don't want to say something like pride because that's not what it gives you. It just, it explains who you are and you can stand upright knowing who you are in Christ. So all of this contributes to who you are in Him. When you see how free and accepted He's made you, you see who you truly are. So I want to go over, I'm just going to go over three scriptures on who we are in Christ, and then I'm going to give you, I don't know, eight or nine of them to, to take a look at. This is, again, just a small sampling of what there is. So let's go to Galatians 3, verse 26 through 29. Galatians 3, 26 through 29 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ, or in Christ Jesus. We could stop right there. We know that we're all children of God through our faith in Christ Jesus. We'll continue with 27, 28, 29. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So all of that promise that was given to Abraham, we are all heirs to that as well. Amen. All right? Let's stay in Galatians for the next two. Let's go to Galatians 4, verse 6 through 7. Galatians 4, verse 6 through 7. And because you are sons, God has set forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So again, here we are straight, we, we are straight heirs to God. Because of what Christ Jesus did. We don't need the priest to be an intercessor for us. That's right. We go straight to God. We are children of God. 
And you know, it really feels good when you look at yourself as a child of the king, the most high king. Come on. It really feels good. So I got one last one in Galatians, and I'm hoping Pastor Paul doesn't jump up and start dancing in front of the camera. Galatians 2.20, you've heard this one before. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That's the biggest part of this that I'm trying to get to today. And the life in which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You guys have heard that a lot. Christ living in you, living in me. I told you I would give you some more for you to look at, and I'm, this is going to take just a minute, but I'm going to go ahead and give you some more scripture. We're not going to pull it up on the screen. Write these down for later. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. First Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 through 10. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. This has got hard lately where I've got to put these glasses on to read some of this. I guess I should have put it in big handwriting, huh? Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Romans chapter 8. Verse 1 and 2. Was the women's group just recently in Romans? Still in Romans. Still in Romans. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. Um, and you know, I, I typically use the New King James Version on everything. But the wording for this next one, Hebrews 10, 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. The wording in the New Living Translation really makes it good. Hebrews 10.10, 10, New Living Translation. Only four more. And then I'm getting back on my soapbox. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 37 through 39. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse twenty-one. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse twenty-one. First Corinthians chapter two, verse sixteen. First Corinthians two sixteen and Philippians chapter two verse thirteen. That's Philippians two thirteen. So all of those are for you to look at a little bit later to see who you are in Christ. And there's a bunch more. But when you know who you are in Christ, you could do great things. You, you could, in fact, as some have said, change the world. Yes, indeed. I'm going to show you how Peter did change the world. So when Peter really recognized and, and saw who he was in Christ, he really became a superhero Christian. And I look at, I don't know, my favorite superhero is Captain America. Um... He's got the, the shield of faith. Um, what did they call the little one? A buckler? 
So, so last week in Bible study, we talked a little bit about the shield and the buckler. And I looked at that as a, as a buckler because it was small. And I was saying, yeah, you could take that buckler and throw it. Knock out the bad guys. Anyways, Peter became, that's another rabbit hole. Peter became a Christian superhero. Yes, he did. Yes. So at Pentecost, he preached and thousands of people were saved. He, was, he became the rock that Christ built the church on. He did miracles. Each and every one of you could do miracles as well because it's Jesus within you. I wanted to go to, that, to, to one of them with Peter and John. Peter and John in Acts chapter 3, verse 6 through 8. Let's look at that one. Acts 3, 6 through 8. And there was a lame man who his parents would would take him to the temple and set him at the, at the entrance every single day. And he would look to people for alms. And Peter and John came walking up. So then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. So, so as they walked up there, they noticed the man and Peter said, you know, look at us. Here we are. We've got such a great thing. Treasures that people usually don't see, but we know it's huge treasures. Straight from Jesus Christ himself, the Messiah. The Savior of the world who could heal anyone of anything. And he said, look at us. Here we are entering, and here's this man looking to us for alms. And that's when he said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. He took him by the hand, by the right hand, and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, the lame, started leaping, stood up, walked, and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. So... Something that every one of us could do Amen. with Christ Jesus inside of us. That's right. All right? Because it wasn't Peter. That's right. It was Christ in him. That's, right. That's who you are with Christ within you. That's right. Oh, I'm getting out of breath. Jesus' prophecy was fulfilled. Peter did change the world, but it was not the man. It was it was. Christ inside of him. Peter found who he was in Christ and that made all the difference. I've only got four more pages. Actually, I'm just going to tell you, dig into the Word. Search Scriptures to discover Christ. Seeing who He is and then search the Scriptures for Christ in you, on who you are in Christ. You're going to start to see yourself in a different light. As you meditate on those scriptures of who you are in Christ, each morning as you wake up, calling to remembrance those scriptures, you're going to see yourself transform in the mirror. You're going to be a different person. You're going to see yourself differently. And you know, the funny thing is, other people are going to see you differently as well. Because that starts to shine through you. They're going to see the difference in you. Then you are going to make a big difference in everything that you do. You know, we can all make a difference just as good people. But with Christ in us, we can make a huge difference. I'm going to leave you with one last scripture. We said to get in the Word, study who Christ is and who you are in Christ. I'm going to leave you this one last scripture. It's 2 Timothy chapter 2, 14 and 15. And this is probably something that most of you can, can remember. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words, to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers, keep going, 
Be diligent. This is the part I wanted you to, to see. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. As you get into God's word, the Holy Spirit will guide you through this. We were given the Spirit yes. Come on. Come on. for power, for guidance, yes. for all of that. Ask the Holy Spirit, ask God to guide you through His Word. You will start getting through there. You will be rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Presenting yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. That's what we need to do. We need to get into God's Word. And you know, it's, <laughs> I don't know. I just thought of myself as maybe a broken record. Because every time I get up here, I tell you, get into God's Word, get into God's Word, get into God's Word. But you know, that's how we build our relationship with God. That's how we are built up as well. So get into God's Word and go and change the world. That's all I've got today. Short but sweet, huh? Let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord for your word, so that we could, we could know how to live our lives, Lord. We know the promises that you, you've given to us. Father, to know we are heirs as your children. Gosh, what a wonderful thing, Lord. To know we are children of the Most High King. Father, we do want to get in the word. We want to be diligent, rightly dividing your word, Lord, that we would, we would understand who we are and how we need to be. Father, we thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy as we, as we stumble at any time, that your hand's there to pick us back up. All we have to do is reach out. You will help us, Lord. We thank you that your love is never ending for us, Lord. And your mercies are new every morning. What a great place to be, Lord, in your love. We thank you for that. Lord, we want to take this word, we want to apply it to our lives, and we want to go out and live it. so that we could give others the good news that they would be able to live in your love, your grace, and your mercy as well, Lord, every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Mm -hmm. God is good. Amen. So I want to just add real quick, if you're not sure what to study or where to study, I want to encourage you to do something different. And I want you to study looking for Jesus in the Old Testament. He's all in there. You got to look because religion hasn't taught us this. Religious is, religion has taught us to go look for the law. I'm telling you, go look for Jesus. Look for Jesus. Study Jesus in the Old Testament and you'll be amazed. Thank you, Brother Bill. Thank you for joining us. Look forward to seeing you again, meeting you in person. And um, love somebody, hug somebody. We'll see you next week. Thanks.